cogent advice, and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Hey, it's Jamie, and welcome to a selects edition of Eventual Millionaire. This is where we go back and find the best of the best, the ones that you loved from the past six seven years. We've been doing this a long time and there's some amazing interviews with amazing guests that you have not seen yet. So we are bringing them back. It is the Selects edition. Let us know what you think and I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jane Masters and you have no idea how excited I am to have Naveen Jane on the phone, on the line. Right now, I have not actually gone after any millionaires to interview in the last probably two years. This one, I heard about him and I was like, I need to get him on the show no matter what it takes because he's amazing. He does a Moon Express, Viome, like a serial entrepreneur to the nth degree and thinks probably bigger than anybody else that I've seen besides the Peter Diamantes, which I'm sure you're friends with also. So thank you so much for coming on the show today, Naveen. Well, thank you, Jimmy. It's very kind, very kind of you to invite me. But so on your sh on your site, you talked about being really humble also. And even in the first 15 minutes that we started talking, I feel like I've known you forever, which is a rarity here. So why do you think being humble and connecting so much is so important? Well, you know, first of all, the only way someone knows you have been successful is when you actually become humble because humility is a sign of success. If you still have an iota of arrogance left in you, that means you're still trying to prove something to yourself or someone else. And the day you become successful is the day you become humble. And the sign, you know, the success is not measured by how much money you have in the bank. Success is always measured by how many people's life you've been able to improve. And if you focus on improving people's life, everything else that comes to you is simply a byproduct of it, right? So if you can go out and help a billion people somehow, you can absolutely create a $10 billion company. If you can go out and solve a problem that's a $10 billion problem, you would create a billion dollar company. So it really is going out and doing things that are meaningful, going out and doing things that helps improve people's lives is how you create amazing, uh, great companies. How can someone do that, especially if they do have a bit of the scarcity mindset or the piece where they don't feel like they could do it all? How can they grow to that level of thinking? So it's really is, it's all is in your, as you say, is in your mindset. The minute you believe something is impossible, it becomes impossible just for you and no one else, right? So the fact is, if you believe it can't be done, it can't be done. If you believe it can be done, then you can go out and do it. What I find really amazing is the minute you go out and put a, a great audacious goal out there, the universe will align itself and find the right set of resources to make that happen. And I can give you countless examples of how that actually starts to become real. But you have to believe, you, you have to have that internal conviction that you're willing to give your last drop of blood to make it happen. So if you believe that something is so uh, ingrained in your body, in your DNA, in your blood, that you're willing to die for it, then you can live for it, right? And that is the thing is that if you want to find what your true passion is, find out what would you do if you had everything in life that you wanted? You have a billion dollars, you have an amazing family, you have everything that you want, what would you do? And if you do that today, you will get everything that you want in life. So it really is taking the life backwards. Doing things that you would have done when you retired is what makes you retire. Exactly what everyone needs to hear right now, too. But how, if we're not there yet, let's say they start bringing sure. something in going, I know this is my mission in life. Uh, this is the impact I want to create. I am so inspired by this. But I'm not willing to give my last drop of blood for like there's levels within that right of especially of, of belief how do we know where we are now in regards to that and yeah, how far so, we can go so again it's uh, it really comes down to why you're doing it if you say i'm doing it because i want to make money or if you say i'm doing it because this thing that i'm doing is so meaningful to me that this is my calling this is my life i am going to dedicate my life to making this happen in that case it's about that journey so it's not about the goal that you put out there it is about the destiny that you set for yourself knowing that even if you never reach that goal 
you have moved the humanity forward. That means it becomes at worst a relay race that you move the humanity forward and somebody is going to take that uh, baton and going to move the humanity further forward and someone is going to help achieve that goal. And if you are the one who can run that race all by yourself, the marathon, all the more better. But you have to believe that it doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to enjoy that journey that is going towards the destination that I care about, that I may not reach there, but it doesn't matter. I never have to look back and say, what for? Because a lot of the times people go out and give up their soul, give up what they stand for, and they get what they were looking for and they look back in life and saying what for i have given up everything that mattered to me to get something that doesn't really matter to me anymore right instead if you say i'm going to go out and try to get things that actually matter to me then it doesn't matter the journey has been tough you didn't have the food along the way you didn't matter you were thirsty for half the time but when you reach that goal and you say it was well worth it do you think it's more about that that level of conviction is it more about finding it or is it about creating it so it's really is about it's an internal thing so you you know it has to come from you who you are it's like happiness you can't find happiness in something else. So for example, you say, well, you know, it is the places I visit make me happy. It is the people are around my life that make me happy. Because the minute there is something or someone that makes you happy, you're given the remote control of your happiness to them, right? That means the one who makes you happy has a control of making you unhappy. And in fact, if you are happy inside, then you can go anywhere in the world and you could be sitting in a dark corner and you'll find happiness because it's right inside you. And if you are unhappy right inside you, you could go to the most beautiful places and you find unhappiness there because you brought it with you. How do you do that? Like I have to, I meditate and I've evolved as a human to yep. focus before on metrics and now I'm focusing on emotions and it has been a, an amazing journey yep. and way more in depth than I ever imagined when I first uh, started it. How do you do that? How do you know and, and cultivate that happiness, especially for advice for people that might not know how to do that? But the interesting thing is, you know, most of the times people get so focused on the process. It is not about the process of how you get there. It is about you wanting it and you will find what works for you, right? Some people, the meditation is what works for them. Other, you know, for me, it is simply closing my eyes and to be able to visualize that the world that I want to create, actually that world can exist. And that's my exercise. So if I have to go make a decision about wanting to do something, I just close my eyes and I visualize and I say, Oh my God, look at this world. This is the world I want to see. Can I visualize that world? And the beauty of, you know, people talk about vision. And what lacks in vision is the visualization, right? And a lot of the times the vision is so hard that you can't visualize. I want to be number one, the biggest market share in this industry. And, uh, you know, now you close your eyes. What does it look like? An answer is nothing. Right, because it really means nothing. And the right vision is something that anyone can simply, even the eyes open, can visualize, right? Martin Luther King, if he said, you know, I want to see the gender equality and I want to see all that, people would have said, what do you really mean? I can't visualize that. But what, it, what he said was so meaningful that he says, I want to see a world where a black man is holding the hand of a white girl walking together in harmony. Now, that's something we all can visualize. Oh, my God, that is, I like that world, right? And that is the part of the visualization. The vision is, can other people actually can sign up for that vision? So as you know, we you know started this company called Wyoming. I didn't say we do the microbiome testing. I didn't say we do this. That is not what it is. It simply said, imagine living in a world where illness is optional. Imagine a world where no one has to suffer with any chronic diseases. Imagine a world where the suffering has been removed because it was your choice. 
Right. That is the world you can imagine saying, oh, my God, I see, remember my grandmother suffering from cancer. I remember the friend of you know, ours died because they had um, Parkinson's. Oh, you know, oh, my God, I can't remember. My memories were taken away from my mother because she got Alzheimer's and she couldn't remember who I was. Right. And that is the sub. You can say, what if all that could go away? What if people who are committing suicide because they're depressed doesn't have to happen? And that's a world we can create together. And that is our vision. And everyone's like, what is, Vi- wait, what is Viome and how do we do that? T- tell everybody what it is and what it does too. So that way they understand how it does this stuff. Because uh, yeah. I even told my assistant about it and she's like, oh, this is amazing. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. So, so Jamie, I mean, think about that. Every single chronic disease, we name these things, but they really are named for the purpose of insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies. God didn't say, oh, let's name this Alzheimer or let's name this depression. The fact is, it is a set of symptoms that are named these diseases so we can go out and create a pharmaceutical drug for it. Right. But the fact remains is that our body is a one system. Uh, every single chronic disease, 95% to 99% of all chronic diseases that we see are simply about chronic inflammation. And the chronic inflammation happens when the immune system is not trained by your gut microbiome, right? So if you think about it, 2,500 years ago, if you know, a philosopher named Hippocrates said, all diseases begin in the gut. What did he know? Right. Then he said something really interesting is that today we struggle. We all say, oh, we need to go on paleo diet. We need to go on a ketogenic diet. We need to be on a low carb diet. We need to be on an Atkins diet. We need to be on lactin diet. And, we need, and the point is, you know what he said? One man's food is another man's poison. That means there is no such thing as a healthy diet. There is no such thing as healthy food. A one man, a, a food that can heal one person can actually inf- uh, cause inflammation in another person. It is one man's food is another man's poison. And the third thing he said was really beautiful, which is let, medis- let food be thy medicine, let thy medicine be the food. And that's all it is. Why do we need the pharmaceutical drugs when the food is the drug we need, right? But pharmaceutical companies have become a parasite on humanity. Their sole purpose is to keep you sick. In fact, all these drugs are simply there to suppress the symptom, not to cure anything. One of the pharmaceutical company CEO once said, you know, the best drug that we develop are the ones that people have to take for the rest of their lives. Imagine what they're saying. What they're saying is the best drugs are the one that cure absolutely nothing so we can continue to make money from you. Now, that person, if he's not ashamed and has committed suicide by now, someone should just kill him. Right. Those are the parasites on yeah. humanity. I mean, these are the actual, the definition of parasite is someone who takes more than it gives is a parasite. Now, I know a lot of the people probably listening to it can say, oh my God, am I the parasite? And you have to ask yourself the question, how much are you giving back to the society versus how much are you taking from the society? And if you're taking more than you're giving, then you are a parasite. They're like, ow, that hurt. No. Uh, and that's that's sort of the point of entrepreneurship, yeah. though, to give, to really make the world a better place and to give more, right? And I love that, Jamie, about you, that because, you know, people are so afraid to say that the things that I am doing actually make money. It's profitable. And as an entrepreneur, I can tell you that doing good and doing well are not mutually exclusive. In fact, the only way to do a large good in the world is to do, uh, you know, to do well, right? Even if you are the richest man in the world, and if you keep losing money, it's only a matter of time you're going to run out of money. So what I say is, if you want to do a small good in the world, you create a nonprofit. If you want to do a large good in the world, then you create for-profit company and become an entrepreneur. So entrepreneurs are the ones that are going to solve the world's biggest problems. Entrepreneurs are the ones that are going to become the next superpower, making the nation states completely irrelevant. Okay, so let's let's help them empower themselves. Because this is the thing, I feel the exact same way. One of the reasons why I started the show was to help those people 
that have the integrity, that really know they can do good in the world, make enough money and, and build their confidence and belief structure enough so that way they know how much they can do. Because I think they hold themselves back because of mindset and belief. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how can we empower them to really go after it, especially when they're looking at the tangible, my car payment, my blah, 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 all these things. They look at this and go, I need, it's hard to, to do these big moonshot goals because of what's re quote unquote reality. So again, remember, a moonshot goal doesn't mean it's not a big um, idea. It's not the, that mean doesn't mean you're going to actually not be able to make your payment. So let's look at uh, Wyoming, right? So first of all, you have to understand this is my now seventh venture. I have never started two ventures in the same industry. That means what I believe once you are good at something and once you become a, an expert in your field, you actually become useless in that field. And here is why, because once you become an expert, you start to take the foundation of what it is in that field for granted. That means at best, you can make an incremental improvement. You can make something slightly better than what someone else has done. But if you want to disrupt something, if you want to make something 10 times or 100 times better, you have to be a non-expert. That means you have to be able to challenge the foundation of everything that people have taken for granted. Right. So I have no background in computer science. I have no background in, uh, and I started the best computer science, a best co company on the internet um, uh, in my early days. I have no background in aerospace, and I started Moon Express, the only company in the universe that has permission to leave Earth orbit and land on any celestial body. Oh, really? On any yeah. celestial body? Yeah. We're the only company that can leave Earth orbit right now, the only company that has permission to do so, right? The point is, I started Wyoming. And I have no background in medicine, no background in science. What is it that does that is because I'm able to look at something and say, why can't it be done? So when I was do, you know, finishing up my project on the Moon Express, I mentioned that is the company that is the, where the purpose is to be able to create a multi-planetary society. So imagine what is the biggest fear we would have is that our whole human species could be wiped out. So all of us as one human species live on a single spacecraft and we call that a spacecraft planet Earth. Now imagine if our spacecraft got hit by a large asteroid, what will happen? We'll all will become dinosaurs, right? What happened to dinosaurs? They all disappeared with that, right? Now, do we want to be that dinosaur? Imagine if you could hear every dinosaur rolling in their grave, what would they be saying? They would be saying if they had one good entrepreneurial dinosaur, we would still be roaming on the moon and the Mars and beyond. But they didn't have the good entrepreneurial dinosaur, but we can have entrepreneurial good human beings, so why not gonna take care of that, right? And so that was, you know, the purpose was, if we can find a way to live off this planet, away from this planet, and if something were to happen to our spacecraft, we will still be there and recreate humanity again. Right. So that's the goal of creating a multi-planetary society. Of course, you know, you have to go out and build a business around it. You can go mine for the resources because moon has 16 quadrillion worth of, uh, you know, minerals, rare earth minerals, platinum grade materials. It has helium three, which is the best isotope for a fusion energy. That means a small quantity of helium three could power the planet Earth for generations to come. And that could become the best way for us to get abundance of clean energy with absolutely, uh, you know, and really cheap, right? So obviously along the way, you can constantly help the humanity be better on earth, but having a plan B of life so we can live on the moon. And people say, why not go to the Mars? And the answer is Mars is a beautiful place and you want to be on the Mars and you want to be on the moons of the Jupiter and the Europa and Titan and you want to be everywhere. But it better to be a lunatic three days away than to be a Martian six months away. Seriously. Because in the beginning, the things are gonna go wrong and you want to be close to your home planet so that you can be evacuated, you can come back. And the problems are very similar, whether you're living on the moon or the Mars. You know, it's low gravity, it is high radiation, and you have to solve those problems. The vast temperature differences. And the human's body is extremely adaptive. And you know, and the technologies are coming online that will allow us to live on the moon and, and the Mars because we don't have to worry about radiation. Nature has solved many of these problems in a sense that we find the bacterial species growing in the radioactive nuclear waste. That means the nature has figured out how to protect its DNA from very high radiation. 
And interestingly, they have figured out how to use the radiation as a source of energy. So they don't need anything else other than the radiation. Now imagine if you can take those genes from those bacteria, use the CRISPR as a technology to modify our own human genes. Suddenly, we can live in radiation and instead of eating pizza, we just want radiation. So in the evening, you'll say, honey, do you want to go out for a walk and get some radiation, right? And that could be our future, right? And that's the kind of thing you have to start imagining because the things that used to be science fiction are now becoming a science reality. And if you can imagine it, you can do it. Okay, so, excuse me. Yeah. I know I was coughing off offline, yeah. so hopefully you can hear me. But so, so within all this, What's crazy is there, we're, A, we're talking about going to the moon, which I love. There are a million problems on yeah. the way. And you're like, oh, we'll figure out this one. Oh, we'll figure out this one. As if they're not a huge wall to surface. How do you look at the problems so simplistically and know that there's going to be a solution? Yeah. So first of all, there are two parts to uh, the question. Number one is that you mentioned that there are plenty of problems along the way of doing the things you're doing, and there are plenty of other problems you could be doing. So, you know, there are often people say, why do you want to go to the moon when people are starving on the planet Earth? Why can't you solve the problem of healthcare? Why can't you problem solve the education, other problems that we're having? And the answer is the mindset of scarcity says you can do this or you can do this. What if you can do this and you can do this, right? So here I am saying, let's save the humanity from potential extinction by creating Moon Express. And by the way, right on planet Earth, let's create Wyom where we can remove, we can make sickness optional. What if we can get rid of all the chronic diseases? And the, once I finish this project, let's go create education system that actually is now designed to uh, work in a new exponential world because our education system just like our healthcare system was designed for a different purpose and our needs are very different today our healthcare system was designed for chronic infl for inflammation uh, and people were dying from inflammation and so they created antibiotics and life was good irony is the solution for that infection is what causes the chronic diseases right so the thing is all the things that we did are the ones why we have a problem on our healthcare the more money we are spending every year in our healthcare the people are getting sicker and sicker interesting thing is most people don't realize that we have more foreign cells in our body then we have the human cells. In fact, if you look at the gene expression and the, as we as humans, our human DNA only produces 20,000 genes and our, the bacteria and viruses and, fun, and the fungi and yeast and the mold in our gut, they produce somewhere between 2 million to 20 million genes. That means at best, we are 1% human. At worst, we are 0.01% human. So we are literally a walking, talking ecosystem designed to carry the, you know, this whole idea of microorganism inside us. And you wonder sometimes, is it us carrying them or they created us for themselves? Right? <laughs> What an existential question. I love it. <laughs> and, and, you know, and interestingly, Jamie, if you have a couple of minutes, I want to tell you yeah. that, you know, my tongue in cheek story of how humans were created. And I think you're going to really enjoy it. I would it. love it. So I think, you know, so I kept wondering, how did humans got created? So you go back and look at the planet Earth and say, wow, you know, the single cell, the bacteria and viruses and eukaryotes, they have been around for billions of years. The humans only were a couple of hundred thousand years old. So how did the humans got created? So here's how I think it happened. One day, all the bacteria and viruses and fung you know, fungi and the yeast and the mold got together and they were all living in Africa. And they say, we're sick and tired of living here. We want to take over the world. And they all looked at each other and they say, and one of the smarter ones said, I think I know what to do. He said, what if we can create something that can carry billions and trillions of us inside them? And all we have to do is keep them healthy. And they're going to run around and find the food for us. They're going to, we're going to make them crave what we want. And they're going to go find that for us. And, and they're going to go all over the world. They're going to poop everywhere. And we're going to go spread and take over the world. And they created humans. <laughs> and amazing thing happened. That was wonderful. Until, you know, just like today, we are afraid of artificial intelligence. Everybody wonders, what if this AI becomes smarter than us? What's going to happen to us as humans? Guess what happened? all these microorganisms start to wonder, oh my God, we just created something. What if it became smarter than us? What will happen? 
So they went to the master and said, Master, Master, we have a problem. What's the problem, son? We just created this thing. What if it became smarter than us? What will we do? Master said, don't worry. Remember inside the human cell, they call that mitochondria. You know what mitochondria is? One of our brothers is bacteria. We have the, our own brother right inside their cell. And we talk to it all the time. So why do you think they age and they get less energy? Because we are telling them that it's time to, <laughs> time to go. <laughs> right? So, and then say, Master, that's brilliant. The other one said, Master, but you are not even thinking straight. You know, they start to develop this thing called brain. What are we going to do with that? His master says, don't worry. Remember, we live inside the gut. We connected that right to their brain. They call that a vagus nerve. Even though they call that a vagus nerve, they think it's like a Las Vegas. But guess what? What happens in the gut doesn't stay in the gut. It goes right to the brain. <laughs> and better yet, remember what makes them feel good, the serotonin thing? We're not going to let them produce it. 90% of all the serotonin, we're going to produce it right ourselves in the gut. So we control how they feel. We use all the stuff that goes in back, back and forth. They call them neurotransmitters. You know what? When they want anything, we tell them what they want. We make them crave. We make them change their behavior by modifying their amygdala. We change their prefrontal cortex by using the microRNA interference. You know, all the dopamine that they makes them feel want to do more of it, we produce it. So all that is stuff that we take care of them. Like a good leader, we make them believe they are in charge, but we are the one who's pulling the strings. So get, sit back, relax, and enjoy your life. And that's how the humans were created. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that's probably 99.9% .9 true also. <laughs> but my point is this tells you that yeah. the, our gut organism, these microbiome, we wage the war against them, but they are the one that actually are part of us, right? It is like we are whole inside our body and we are part of this larger ecosystem called universe. And we all symbiotic relationship. When we destroy our environment, we are destroying ourselves. When we destroy the environment inside our gut by eating, glyphosate, the plasticides, the GMO food, the processed food. Guess what's happening? We are destroying the environment inside us and that ecosystem is dying and that's what creates these chronic diseases, right? 70% of all the immune system is along our gut lining. Our immune system is trained by our microbiome. When the mother, you know, when the baby is born, the mother gives it basically the life and it gives it the microbiome. So as the baby is going through the birth canal, this is really when the baby gets the, all the exposure to the microbiome from the mother. Right? And then the interesting thing is the breastfeeding, the breast milk is really the one in the first seven days you get something called colostrum. That cannot be digested by the human body. It is there purely to feed the gut microbiome. So imagine what nature is saying, that I created this offspring. The best way to keep the offspring healthy is not to feed it, but to feed them. Imagine that for a second here, that they're saying is that if our microbiome is healthy, our offspring will be healthy, and then we're gonna feed that, nurture it, and grow it, and they'll take care of the rest. And as we grow up, we forget that. Or, or we don't even realize any of that. So to, yeah. what made you so curious to go down that? You weren't even in that industry. You weren't in health. And now yeah. you just told us amazing stories that you know a ton about. Yeah. So how did you even go down that path? Yeah, so basically, again, as I was finishing up the project of landing on the moon, and once you have done the moon shot, what do you do for right? an encore? What do you do for an encore? <laughs> right. You do another moon now shot, what? right? <laughs> Yes, another moonshot is, and you know, I was, you know, I I read a lot, and I think you will find that people who do amazing things they read a lot. So I start to read all the stuff around what makes people sick, and it became clear to me that in the last five years, all the research is pointing to the fact that if you just Google uh, Parkinson's and microbiome, Alzheimer and microbiome, depression and microbiome, anxiety. PTSD, OCD, obesity, diabetes, cancer, and autoimmune diseases, every one of the things are directly influenced and connected to our microbiome. Mm. In fact, so much so, they just the research came out two weeks ago that says the pancreatic cancer is caused by the microbiome moving from gut to the pancreas, shutting down the immune system, causing the pancreatic cancer. 
They did a Mayo Clinic published research three months ago that the breast cancer is caused by the microbiome because they took 1,600 breast cancer tissue and find the microbiome in all of them, right? Interesting thing is, then the two research came out recently that talked about whether the chemotherapy is going to work or it's going to kill you depends on your microbiome, whether the immunotherapy works or absolutely does not work depends on your microbiome. And you start to see every one of these diseases is being caused by them and actually being modulated by them. And you can adjust your microbiome. You can't adjust your genes, but you can adjust your microbiome. And your microbiome modulates your gene expression. So I don't know if you know or not, Mm -hmm. our human genes are, you know, DNA is very interesting. Every part of our body has the same DNA. So our hair have the same DNA as our skin, our heart, and the lung, but they all look different. So what makes them different to their same DNA is what is being expressed. Right. So what expresses changes the same DNA into your hair or your tooth or your lung or your heart. Now, imagine that control mechanism of what they express is also by used by the microbiome to control what genes are being expressed. So, for example, if you have a BRCA mutation called BRCA1 or BRCA2, people think you're going to get breast cancer. That's not true because what is BRCA is a protective gene. If it is being expressed, whether you have a mutation or not, it doesn't matter, then you're going to be protected. So your microbiome can adjust epigenetically for BRCA to be expressed. And if it is being expressed, then you're going to have actually a protection that you need. So the answer is, if you eat the right food, the problem you have so far has had is that no one knows what was the right food until the technology like Wyom came about. So as you know, uh, this technology is licensed from Los Alamos National Lab where it was designed for the biodefense work. So interestingly, I thought I was eating really healthy. So I was, I decided I want to lose weight and I was, you know, I was pre-diabetic and I wanted to take control of my body. And everyone told me it's really easy. Cut down all the carbs, start eating healthy. And, and they say, cut down the starch, no carbs for you. Start eating spinach and oats and avocado and no gluten, no nothing and you will be healthy. It turns out the first few months I lost some weight and I thought I was doing good. Year later, my weight is coming back, my glucose is coming back, and I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture? And then I started Wyo, and I did my test. It turns out that everything that I thought was healthy for me was unhealthy for me. The things that were really bad for me was spinach, avocado, oats, and you know, lentil, legumes, tofu. And the things that I needed to be eating was carbs. 50% of my diet needs to be now carbs. And, you know, I'm thinking, oh, my God. So the interesting thing is there is no such thing as universal healthy diet. It is about what is healthy for you and what's healthy for me. Ah, And what is healthy for you today won't be healthy for you for three months from now. Because what happens is as you change your diet, you're feeding one set of microbes and not others. And your body adjusts and your microbes adjust. So things that used to be good for you suddenly become bad for you. And that means every three months or so, you have to fine tune your body. And that is the beauty of the thing is for the first time in the human history, we can take a touch of your stool and able to tell you everything that's happening inside your body. Is your gut producing short chain fatty acid like butyrate, propionate that are really good for you? Or are it's producing LPS, which is lipopolysaccharide that causes inflammation in your body? Is it producing the vitamins that you need or is it producing the toxins that are causing you grief? If you eat, uh, you know, people on paleo diet, we see them killing themselves because they eat so much protein, it's starting to go to their colon and they start to feed the called protein fermenters. And these protein fermenters release ammonia and all the toxins that cause inflammation. People who are on intermittent fasting, we see the microbes are eating the gut lining because they don't have food to eat. So they start eating the gut lining and there gets a leaky gut and the epithelial barrel gets really weak, right? Wow. So the point is everything that we thought was healthy for us is no longer healthy. So it has to be constantly personalized and fine-tuned like a you know, finely tuned car. You have to keep tuning it or it goes out of tune. So I love how throughout time makes a difference. So this is what my friend was telling me about because he was, he was showing me the stats and I'm a data geek too. So I'm looking yeah. at all the stuff going, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And so, but what he, what he said that really struck me was, oh, and you need to get, keep getting it tested. And I was like, well, of course you do, right? Because that's, but when he went through and said, well, it changes... It just makes logical sense that we are not static human beings and the paleo diet isn't going to work forever for us. And and as you move through life, things change. 
And the anyway, point is, a human body, think about the, it, the chronic disease. We talk about chronic disease. What is one chronic disease that kills everyone? It's called aging. Yeah. Right? Yep. Aging is a chronic disease. Basically, is because our body has been constantly being damaged, we eventually start to age. What if we can keep our body as a finely tuned car? And they did a very interesting research. Uh, they took thousands of people who were 90 years old and they looked at the people who were healthy and the people who were unhealthy. And it turns out people who were 90 years old and healthy had a gut microbiome and very similar to when uh, you know, people who are 20 years old. Uh-huh. So when the gut microbiome is healthy, diverse, and it's really thriving ecosystem like Amazonian forest, people are staying healthy to the 90-year-olds. Wow. Right? And when they are sick are because they have absolutely destroyed their microbiome by eating the food that is inflammatory, by taking antibiotics, by doing things that are uh, you know, not working out, stress. I mean, all those things really affect your microbiome. Okay. Then when we talk about entrepreneurs and the stress yeah. and the I, – I interviewed – um, over a hundred for my book and asked them what type of food they ate. And most said the entrepreneur diet. I eat whatever I can, whenever I can. Right. Yeah, and yeah. so, so explain the, the mental clarity and the other things just from a being healthier, like without any disease, of course, but just yeah. the mental clarity and the feeling better. So we can be better business owners and do more because of that. And it's very interesting to me is becoming a business owner really, uh, is all about the clarity of thoughts. Having a focus uh, to be able, as I said, you know, sometimes I'm so laser focused, I could, I could, world could go around me, could just blow up and I won't notice it because I'm so laser focused on what I'm doing, right? And that and the clarity of thought, I know exactly why am I doing it. So there is no brain fogginess in me. It is clarity of thought. It comes because I have a clarity of thought and your mind uh, uh, alertness comes basically because my body is in tune with my gut. So when your mother says, listen to your gut, she was the doctor. She was the scientist, right? When we get anxiety, you see the butterfly in the stomach. You don't get the butterfly in your head, right? So your gut actually is really the primary brain, in my opinion. And it's simply pulling the string to the top of the shoulder that things we think is a brain, but it's really simply following the direction. So when we talk about there is no free will, and a lot of the neuroscientists will tell you that there is no free will. That means the decision gets made even before you know it, and they call that a subconscious mind. Yeah. And I wonder if they're talking about the gut. Really think about that in the olden days, we used to believe the earth is the center of our solar system. And when Galileo said, maybe we go around the sun, people wanted to kill him. What if we find out that our gut is really the key and the world, the whole body revolves around the gut. That is our sun and this is our earth. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great way to put it. Works out perfectly for your total uh, thought process of everything. I I love the new way that you think of things and what you were saying beforehand and how you can sort of be in a new industry and go, wait, let me connect the dots this way instead of this way is insane. How can you get that level of effectiveness, right? It sounds like you've done this forever. Viome isn't that long of a company. How how long has it been open? One year. (laughs) One one year. Like that's insane. And I think we have first three months, 10,000 people signed up. And the reason they signed up is because every one of our customer tells us they are feeling better. And they feel better because they say, oh, my acne is gone. We didn't set out to cure acne. People, uh, one of the women went on Dr. Oz show said she lost 71 pounds just following the Wyom diet. We didn't set out to lose weight. We simply fixed her gut and the inflammation that was going on. People, uh, you know, are posting their videos on YouTube and saying, I used to be depressed and it's gone. Now, we didn't set out to cure depression because we don't do that. We simply fix the gut. And really that what I'm trying to say is that what I do is by reading a lot, I'm collecting the dots. And when you keep collecting the dots, sometimes you find that missing dot and you say, aha, now I can solve this problem because puzzle that piece was missing, right? So when I saw the Los Alamos National Lab and they told me that they're working on this biodefense thing that can look inside the body and tell you what's making you sick. Remember the same problem with biodefense, right? And so, aha, that was the dot that was missing. Now I can solve the healthcare problem. 
It's so, but and what's so amazing is with with technology moving forward faster, there's more puzzle pieces that we get to get every exactly. single time. <laughs> and by the way, you should never be afraid because someone is doing it before you. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is in the olden days, you have an advantage because you've been doing it for four, five, ten years. Interestingly, as you mentioned with the exponential technologies, it doesn't matter what you do. It become obsolete in five to seven years. So if someone is coming seven years after you, that means you're closer to being obsolete and dead. And they are coming out with a new technology that you don't even know what to do with. Right. Such a good perspective, good way to look at it. <laughs> I love how optimistic and happy you are also, by the way. It oozes, it oozes from you. And I really feel like that's what entrepreneurs need a lot more of also, to be focused on that piece and less on the, oh my gosh, this sucks, I'm a problem solver and I look for problems everywhere. So point is, if you are happy inside, you can share that happiness with the world, right? If you are bitchy and uh, hate yourself, Guess what do you have to share? The bitchiness and hatefulness with the world, right? So I find if I, you know, you fall in love with yourself. I don't mean becoming uh, a self-obsessed. Falling in love with yourself means not looking for someone else's approval, right? That means you self-approve who you are. And that means now you can share your love. You can share your happiness with the world, with the people you are around you. You can't change the world if you can't change yourself. So first you change yourself, fall in love with yourself, and then you can love the world and you can love everyone around you. Spiritual guru slash serial entrepreneur slash I love all of this. I know we have to start wrapping up. I'm going to ask the last question. I know you turned it on me earlier, which was lovely. Uh, what's one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? And again, I just say it. That is a wrong goal. Making money is like having an orgasm. If you focus on it, you'll never get it. So the best way to make a million dollars is to actually focus on doing things that are meaningful, something that you really care about doing. So find something that you're willing to die for and then you live for it. Find something that you would do when you had everything in your life, the billion dollars and the family and the loving thing that you want. What would you do? And if you do that today, you will get everything that you want. So so start thinking about what would you do when you're retired is what will make you retire today if you do those things. <laughs> oh, I love this. And I just I have to say my father just retired. Yeah. was unhappy at a job for many, many years. Yeah. Yeah. He is now doing what he loves. He's building furniture and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And the level of happiness as a human being, I can't even my children call him Grumpa because he's so he was so yeah. grumpy before. And now yeah. we have to change the name because he's so inspired and happy and a different human being. And by the way, he's gonna build a great business now at, at this age. <laughs> right? As yeah. I keep telling him. I like, ooh. But but it's sad that people are going through that right now and might not even realize that piece. And that's the thing is that at any point of time when you find yourself in life, mm -hmm. when you are not happy. It's better to take yourself out of that situation. Get rid of everyone who brings you down. Get rid of anyone who laughs at your ambition. And only surround yourself with people who believe in you. They prop you up and they say, I believe in you. You can do it. Just go make it happen. And you know when you fall back, I will be there to protect you before you fall on earth. Right. And that is the kind of things. If we can do that for everyone around us to protect them when they are falling and prop them up when they need just a little bit of boost. So it's not about giving them a handout. It's about listening to them and allowing them to tell their story. So next time you see a homeless person, don't drop a dollar. Stop for one minute and ask them what happened. And if you just listen to their story, you will do more for them than giving them that dollar. So take care of the world because you you know the world will take care of you. You are so inspiring. Okay, so where can we get more from you? Like I want to follow everything you do. So where can we find out all of the things so that way they can get more words of wisdom? Well, first of all, you, you know, of course, you can follow me on the social media on Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, Facebook. In addition to that, uh, you know, if you want to send me an email, uh, uh, my email is my first name, Naveen, N-A-V-E-E-N -E -E dot my last name, J-A-I-N at gmail dot com. So feel free to send me an email. Uh, if you have any question, anything, you know, I'm always there for you and I love you. You're the best. Just so you know, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I so, 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 so appreciate it. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate it, too.
Thank you for listening and investing in yourself with your time. I so appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this episode, I would be forever grateful if you would be willing to leave a rating or review in whatever app you use for your podcast. I know that's what really bumps it up in the rankings. And I would so appreciate your time, especially if you've been a long time listener. But of course, if you like this episode and you're brand new, thank 